ANC presidential hopeful Matthew Sposa says there is no unity in the ANC-led government. Sposa accuses the ANC of spitting on the constitution by continuing to allow the president, Jacob Zuma, to remain in office despite the Nkandla constitutional court ruling. Our reporter, Aldrin Saint-Pierre, sat down with Sposa for an exclusive interview. With the Nkanda issue is that you have this molecule right now. You have a molecule where you say that pre the Nkanda debate or the Nkanda debacle, the ANC could have been more wise how to deal with the issue. But anyway, then it happened. Then there was a constitutional court case. Post the constitutional court case, what has the ANC done? The ANC has disgraced itself by taking collective responsibility. You know, it's like sliding down. You understand what I'm saying? Away from Nkanda, there were many on goals. Dismiss Nene for reasons which were not very clear. And then appoint Van Royen for the weekend, you know, spe weekend special minister. And then remove him, put Bravin. A year later, try and charge Bravin. It is war at the executive level. There's war with the law enforcement institutions, the Hawks, um, IP, and then to top it up. Balula and Tlemeza. There's war. There's no cohesion in government at the moment. We need to quieten the noise and kill the noise and have stability and move on. In parliament, parliament has been reduced to a talk shop, a brawl, and it has been humiliated in the eyes of our people. Our people want dignity and respect in that parliament. It is the responsibility of all the parties then in terms of that. But when the report of Uganda went to parliament, what happened? We as ANC did not give proper leadership. And the court pronounced on that. We, in the subcommittee report, we endorsed it, we produced it against the opposition parties, saying, please, can't endorse this thing. Now, National Assembly had dropped the ball, but now it was a wake-up call for them. They've learned their lesson. You can see now the committees are beginning to be more activist, and we should encourage that. And, and if, you, if, you, if you have this situation right now where you would, some would argue that the ANC failed to act against the president on the Nganda issue, considering the findings of, of not only the public protector, but now also the constitutional court case. Now you have this situation in Parliament. There was a motion pushed even back then, after the court ruling last year, by the opposition, this was the DA, calling on a vote of no confidence against the president. Um, that vote went ahead, and um, the opposition party failed. There was a second one, if I'm not mistaken, last year as well. You, that are, one failed as you, you well. are right. And there is now this one that we are currently facing. And then some wonder, why is the argument now different? Why is the expectation from ANC members different now that now they should be voting with the opposition party to remove President Jacobson? I just want your thoughts on that. Let me tell you, I'm not in parliament to be able to, to, do, to do the numbers. It's up to the comrades. And I think Comrade uh, Tabo, former president, has dealt with this matter, the responsibilities of members of parliament. I don't want to go there. He's right. But let me tell you, as an ANC member, I feel that the ANC has got a responsibility to drive a motion in the NEC asking President Zuma to step down. The one last year failed. No, no, but it doesn't matter. Mm. This thing has been escalating. You can see the divisions. Look at the officials. Even on an issue right now about whether or not there was a, a spy report. I mean, they pronounce themselves on Monday in a particular way, and on Wednesday they pronounce them, themselves differently, which impacts on the credibility not only of them, but also of the party itself. Where, what is it? Is there a spy document or not? Marshall says he has never seen it. The president says in the court papers, he doesn't know about it, they must produce it. Chaos. We need. How did you arrive at this point? So, I mean, How did you arrive then, at the point where then, you have the secretary general of the party, the deputy president of the party, the second in charge after the president, saying publicly that there is this um, intelligence report that the president wants to use, and even you had Gwede Mandashe during the press briefing after the extended NEC meeting, saying that um, the reason why we opposed the reshuffle was because of this intelligence report. And the president saying that, um, you know what, um, the DA must produce this intelligence report. But I'm saying... How have decisions, I'm, such huge decisions, caused so much divisions within the ANC, even at the highest level of the party? But I'm raising the issue with you. I'm saying it's a, it's a, it's a demonstration of lack of coherent leadership. But uh, 
if you go back to the nitty gritty of it, the president did not consult them on the reshuffle according to what they say. If they are telling the truth, then the president consulted himself, which is a step towards a dictatorship. I mean, but, in reality. But, but, even, but even if the president could have consulted himself, how did they know about this so called intelligence? No, no, I don't know about it. I'm watching the movie as it moves around. I think they should have sat down with him before they made pronouncement and, and show respect and say, Mr. President, this has happened now. Indoors, what really happened? Is there a spy report or not? I think they will have arrived at different conclusions. In a way, I just think they spoke too early. Do you think that was a, a wrong foot for them to go publicly and, oh, they spoke, and speak uh, against the, or mention, for instance, the intelligence report? No, I don't mind. I guess I, now I'm asking you as an attendee. No, no. I, I don't mind them saying anything about anyone, but I think they should have consulted themselves internally and found a, a common response to the so-called spy report. And maybe the president will have told them there is no such a report. And in all, all fairness to the president, I mean, they should have talked to him. But I don't know if they talked, but if they talked to him, you'd have talked to them like he's talking on court papers. Show me the report. Mm -hmm. So I think give him credit for that. Mm. Mm. And, and just speaking about um, this, this court case itself, the essence of the court case, the DA's application, is to find out whether the president was rational in his cabinet, in his decision to reshuffle cabinet, but quite particularly to remove the finance minister as well as the deputy finance minister. What's your take on this? My first take is that uh, it is the president's prerogative to say who must be in cabinet, who must not be in cabinet. And he doesn't even have to consult anybody. That's the constitution. It doesn't say you appoint after consultation, which is called a legal meaning. It's just got, it's got the right to appoint. But if there's a court case, which is me and you must respect the sub judicial, mm -hmm. I'm not going to pass judgment on the process of court. I'm a lawyer. Let it take its course. But it, there must be a test of rationality, I reckon. I have no problem with that. It's all in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So let the court engage the matter. Let it be argued. Let's all be bound by the results. It's sub judicate, and we must teach the public. When the matter is sub judicate, you say little. Earlier on, you spoke about how the ANC is spitting on the Constitution, how, quote unquote, you say we are spitting on the Constitution. Um, what has led to this situation? And it takes me back to an interview that I had with Tabombeke as well last week where he said that for as long as there's no respect for the rule of law, these court cases against government will continue. President Mbeki is absolutely correct. I agree with him. Because the prince, principles of that constitution are well known to all of us. We drafted it. We should be the first one to interpret it correctly and not be reminded by the DA what the constitution says or even by the courts. We must be disciplined. And, you know, people in NC talk about being disciplined. Here yeah, we are not disciplined in terms of the Constitution. We do wrong things. We violate the Constitution. So Tabon Beg is correct. We must abide by the rule of law, and which is in, in, in embedded in the Constitution. What causes that? What causes a point where you have a court ruling, like let's bring in the, the, the case against the former Hawks boss, Bernie Glemeza, for instance, where court has said um, that this person is untrustworthy, yet you had the minister at the time who still appointed him and made him a permanent head of the Hawks. What causes that, that mindset that even though a court has made a decision or has made a ruling and has mentioned or has made some findings against somebody, you then bring that down to it being simply an opinion? Simply it's, not an, it's not an opinion. It doesn't clerk all. It was wrong. That's what I'm talking about. We spit at the Constitution. We spit at, at, at the courts. We even spit at the judges. We should not do those things. We should respect our institutions. Yes, the separation of power and the other arms of government, being the executive and the legislature, must respect the rules of the court. The Constitution says the constitutional court is ultimate arbiter. Finish and Clar is the ultimate arbiter. You don't go around it to find loopholes. Look at what uh, the Minister of Social, Work, Social, Social Services did. The constitutional court makes a ruling. And she finds all sorts of, of reasons to violate that ruling. And you saw for the first time Chief Justice Mukwege Mukwege when the proceedings were going on. He was furious. Why do we put our judges in such difficulties? But by not observing the judgment of the court. It's wrong. Sure. Even res disrespecting the other institution like public protector and then the predominantly public protector has been under attack. Why? 
Because people hold different views. You don't have to abuse one of those institutions, whether it's Human Rights Commission or the General. You've got to listen to them carefully. They are checks and balances on the democratic system. What are the dangers um, when it, that continues happening, when continuously court rulings are being ignored, when continuously the interpretation, as they would say, that they've tried to interpret the law, is misinterpreted? It's not misinterpreted. It's delinquent behavior by politicians. You know, the, the price we pay is loss of trust in the NC and loss of power by the NC in the very near future. Once you lose, the people lose trust in you. And I'm going back to your first question. We will sink to the rock bottom. And it's going to be a struggle to lift us up. You see, it took 106 years to build this party. It will take a year only to destroy it. And it's been destroyed at the moment by many own goals. And we need to stop that. And one of the, re the ways of stopping it, you know, you're almost tempted to say, if the NEC is not prepared to lead, they should be honorable enough to say, let's go Zuma. They must be prepared to lead. We can't be asked to unite around corruption. I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough call on us as members of the NEC. We can't be asked to accompany the ANC to its funeral. We must resist that and want to rescue the ANC and unite it. But not on the basis of corruption, not on the basis of protecting one another. No, on the basis of the values of the ANC as we know them in the Freedom Charter, partly enshrined in our own constitution. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We've got precedents of good precedents in this country and good leadership. But the leadership must look, do a soul searching. I'm repeating look ourselves in the mirror and find out whether our faces still look like in 1994. I think we'd like to find they don't look the same.